Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Channel Talks. I'm Nick Verikios, and in this episode, we're going to be answering your call. You've asked us to get for a deep dive into that topic of ecosystems versus traditional channels, and that's what we'll be doing. And I'm thrilled I can deliver that to you uh, today in today's Channel Talks with two of the industry's finest. They've been around for over 30 years, and each have, has had a deep involvement, not only watching, but also influencing uh, a all, always evolving channel. So uh, firstly, we've got Julian uh, Lee. Julian is the president at TechnoPlanet who assists technology vendors in the development of their channel partner ecosystem, so obviously relevant. Julian's also the publisher of the famous e-channel news with an 80,000 strong, I think, Julian subscriber community these days. Um, he also organizes Channel Next, which is a channel education conference and is the host of e-channel news' podcast, where Julian interviews channel chiefs across the globe. Uh, and sees what's on top of mind for them. And, of course, we've got Scott Frew, who's the founder and CEO of iAsset.com, uh, which is the world's first and most comprehensive ecosystem, CPQ. So, therefore, there's a major relevance there. Um, uh, iAsset.com, uh, of course, it assures recurring, annual recurring revenues by using a lot of intelligence uh, into data. It's data-driven, reorganizing, and automates renewals, expansion, extension, and other sales initiatives that are around installed-based selling. Uh, so I think we're qualified to answer that question. Let's jump right into it. I wanted to mystify the terminologies as well because the amount of times I get DMs after these shows where everyone's just wanting to know what, do you, what is this ecosystem thing and what is the difference between that and this evolving traditional channel. So uh, let's get right into it, gents. Uh, well, thank you. Welcome uh, again for being here. Um, and we'll start with you know, the, what I get asked the most, what's the difference, Nick? And why does it matter? What's the difference between ecosystems and, and traditional channels? Why are we giving it a new name? Is the IT industry being silly again and just giving names to uh, things that already exist? So, Julie, can I start with you? Sure. Why not? Well, th uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure. You know, um, yeah, I think you, you're exactly right. I think we're just changing the name of it uh, because we in a techn in, in technology industry, we like to change things around. Um, but in reality, um, it's something that's always been there, right? I think we're just, it's coming into focus. Um, I think we're moving from the, as they like to call the hard metal, you know, gold, silver, tin type platinum, you know, uh, yeah. programs to a more specific centric around the actual skill set of the partners, which, is, which it probably should have, uh, should have been in the past. But uh, in the old days, it was pretty much transactional. So how much money you bought, sold, that type of thing was really what determined your positioning within a company. And I think a lot of the folks sort of built the programs around that to support that. Um, problem with that is that if you support only your top providers, let's say your top 20% of your customers, that means that they will in turn control all your business. And, um, and as they consolidate, that number is going to go from 20 to 10%. And as they consolidate further, that's going to go to 5%. And then what you're going to end up happening is a concentration of companies, very few companies who control the vast majority of your sales. And of course, the system was designed for them, right? To make the most money from them and from you. So therefore, you know, that serves a certain percentage of the community, the partner community. But then what happens to the other, you know, 80, 85, 95% of the channel? Um, do you just let them run wild and, uh, you know, automate them? Or do you give them a lifeline? And I think the ecosystem is a lifeline, um, a very important lifeline that is way overdue because it's going to give the, um, the channel partner, if you will, um, the ability to have a different set of rules, uh, different rules of engagement. So if I'm, for example, a company that's influencing sales because I'm consulting, but I don't transact, am I less valuable to the organization than someone who actually does the transaction itself? Um, I may just want to be the consultant. Um, and therefore, you know, how do you compensate me? How do you recognize me, first of all? Uh, so an ecosystem for me is more of an all-inclusive, brings everybody into the fold. And so we can recognize value by each of the individual, um, you know, companies um, or individuals uh, coming to the table, as opposed to just the transactional folks, 
which I think uh, is kind of like long, long gone. Um, and I think uh, one of the biggest catalysts that actually drove that change, interestingly enough, is the influx of all the various companies, ISVs and, and different telcos and digital marketing agencies and so on that has thrown their hat into this thing we call the channel. Yeah. And when they enter, they have no clue what it is. So therefore, you know, they're they're sort of saying, what? You know, how do we work together with you folks if we don't do what you folks do? Mm-hmm. So I think that's it's still early days, but you know, that's my my two cents on it. Yeah. So Julian, I, I think you're right there in that it, it is more inclusive because there are so many people that touch the transaction these days. The transaction is still there and it's still necessary, otherwise, nothing gets done. And Scott, you you see it from a transaction lens and an automation lens. We also talk about, uh, Julian also talked about what we call uh, what happens when it's points and not margin and how do you build that into the transaction to uh, compensate everyone. What's your take on the difference in how transactions evolve given uh, you're heavily involved in transactions for over 30 years? Well, look, I think, Nick, um, to your earlier point about uh, democracy, right? A creation of an ecosystem is all parties rely on each other rather than historically it's been the vendor at the top and everyone pyramided underneath and, and that's historically where we've been. Now, that's not to say most of the channel is still in that mode. It doesn't matter what they call it because they're all changing their name to ecosystem, yeah. but it's still, you know, a bunch of distributors and a whole bunch of SPs or bars underneath. Um, an ecosystem, as I said, I think Microsoft has taken a step in the right direction, but you're still challenged with how do you tie in the transactional piece of the influencer that potentially worked on the site? Yep. Off the top of my head, I think our friend Jay McBain says there's seven different parties involved in the process of making that purchase. How do you actually join them all in a, in a, in a relationship that means that they get remunerated in whatever way they, or shape or form they need to be remunerated in to make sure that they're, they're doing the right job across that democracy rather than sort of the, I wouldn't even say beneficial dictatorships of vendors, sometimes just dictatorships, let's call it that. Yeah. Yeah, what, what, what I want to throw at you guys, it looks like to me, um, unless we work out how we're going to compensate the entire ecosystem, really easy to compensate the traditional channel, it's margins, right? But how do you compensate the entire ecosystem that's not involved in the transaction but in but is in, is actually totally involved in the influencing of that ultimate uh, end user sale. Are you seeing any best practices? Are you seeing anything coming out, Julian? You talked about changing rules of engagement. Does that does that talk into that 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 we have to work that out? And the reason why I think it's so important before before I hand it over to you guys is I remember I'm old enough too to remember how much cloud struggled. You know, struggled and struggled and struggled until they got the compensation model right, and then bang, boom, and now everything's moving to cloud, and we all agree because we've got the compensation model right. Unless we get the compensation right model right for ecosystems, the economics won't work, and maybe it will be another one of those just words that everyone uses. Scott, I'm going to get you to respond, but through the lens of you, you you have launched the SaaS company. It's a 15 year old startup, and uh, it's it's going really well. You 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 do see everything running through a channel, but you know that there's also multiple spheres of influence. How has iAsset managed, as a SaaS company, managed to compensate the non-transacting side of uh, your ecosystem? So we went for a very simple route. We went for our influencer program, and that was to reach into, there are, you know, the big four, there are all of these management consultants out there that are people that are trying to... Um, solve problems for uh, all sorts of channel-based organizations and it was to reach in and recognize them uh, in a way that we know they're not going to actually physically close the deal because they don't have the professional services resources or the, the the devs to do all of the bits and pieces around the edge so we have that program which there's I don't know, 12 or 15 partners now signed up and all they do is um, the management consulting piece, if you like, or the consulting piece at a at a transactional level, and then they bring us in, and when they bring us in, they get recognised for that. So if a, if a deal closes, they get remunerated for that, and that has worked really, really successfully because it's almost um, all care but no responsibility. You know, we have to carry the can at the end of the day, but it does open us up, and then you these consultants are doing you know best practice, so. You know, install-based selling and product life cycles in the IT channel, 
we're pretty much it. I mean, there's plenty of CPQs, there's plenty of renewals platforms, uh, but when it comes to that entire, entire install base tracking piece and then mining it for sales, we're it. So we need these consultative guys at the front of us who are explaining to the customer what the opportunity is and then how to deploy it and how to connect it to all their existing legacy systems. Okay, yeah, that that's... Hi, can I, can I ask you a question? Your platform, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you... You, you plugged in a whole bunch of other SaaS companies into your platform and you allow them, it's like a marketplace, right? And allows them to manage transaction, provisioning and renewals and all that stuff. Is that right? It's it's a little bit uh, different to that, Julian. So we're not an orchestration type platform. So very quickly, if you think um, every single player in the IT or technology channels has four things they need to achieve, we call it LIPS, Land, Invest, Protect, Surrender. So land is automate the front end net new quoting as quickly as possible, add all of the fries and the cakes to the burger so that whoever's using it doesn't miss the extras. Once you've transacted that, we send that to the ERP system. ERP system tells us it's been invoiced. Once that invoice has happened, we start product life cycles. Now, if you're a vendor, it's all about expand. How do I keep selling more? You know, if you're Palo Alto Networks, how do I sell more Palo Alto, Cisco, Cisco, whatever it is? If you're a distributor or a reseller, you might also want to sell other products. So if you've sold NetApp, you might want to sell uh, Juniper, whatever it is. And then you go into protect phase. Protect is everyone talks about renewals, but renewals is the last thing you want to do because in a lot of situations, you know, if it's a three-year contract or it's consumption, there's other actions to take than just a straight renewal. So we always say you only renew if everything else has failed. So you can still automate all of the $200 AV licenses like we do for some of the uh, manufacturers, but really you want to make decisions before you get to that state. And then the last part, which no one handles in the industry, is surrender. So what do you do in an EOS or end-of-life, end-of-support type environment? Everyone leaves it on the table. So there are companies out there running end-of-life type products. So... Within that connection to other SaaS platforms, we connect to ERP, we connect to uh, support desks, we connect to license management systems because everyone's got these little lily pads of data around the pond. We connect all the pads together, not only internally in the company that's using us, but to their partners downstream or upstream, if that makes sense. You see, that's brilliant. You see, that's exactly what... Yeah, that's exactly what the channel needs, right? Yeah, yeah. They need to glue these pieces together because everybody is running around their silos doing whatever they're doing and nobody's talking to each other, right? But the reality is the people that's going to end up winning uh, the day are the ones who are able to glue these pieces together. Absolutely. And uh, quite honestly, it's like it's foundational in ecosystems and marketplaces because if you don't have this um, mindset, in pulling all the you know players on the same you know in the same room if you will so they can play nice together in the sandbox as I say right um, then then what have you you know you you're just simply disconnected again and I think the mission is where you're headed is uh, the ability to um, you know widen your glue if you will the connectivity yeah. points mm. and bring people together so they can transact with minimal friction as possible. Yeah. And so uh, kudos to you. Great stuff. The product is on its way, much more developed than I uh, than I remember. Oh, well, it's been a long time since we last. Yeah. Well, good right. for you. Excellent. If, Bravo. If you, look at, if you look at those IT channel guys, you know, the, the big thing about this automation play is you've got people firing tens of thousands of people. You know, the inflation's going up, the economy's going bad. This is actually the time when you'll see us grow even faster because you need to automate all those processes you've just got rid of all of those people to do and connect all of your partners together and and rich um, data. I mean, as Nick said the other night, uh, you know, data is the new oil, which everyone's been talking about. I actually say data is crude oil. You need to actually refine it to make it valuable. <laughs> you see, you're again, you're on point because, yeah, it's really easy to say it's uh, the oil, but, uh, you know, digging oil, if you and I dug oil out of the ground, how do we put them into our car? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> right. Somebody's got to refine that thing. You yeah, know, don't you, don't you hate it when someone quotes you and quotes you completely wrong? You're, you're, <laughs> almost, you're almost right, Scott. What I said was, if data is the new oil, everyone's doing a shit job about it because they're not mining it. They're not doing anything with it. But most importantly, it's because it was collected for a different purpose. And yeah. when you're starting to talk about how ecosystems will 
help organizations manage annual recurring revenue. It's about installed based management, installed based selling. So you need platforms to rearrange that data and make it useful in the new world of the of the ecosystems rather than just waiting for someone. And if if it's true, uh, Julian, that it levels the playing field, what I'm hearing is, yeah, it does, but you have to be proactive because you have to understand that there's multiple influence, there's a lot of automation and multiple transactions, especially as you move across into uh, moving from hard assets to cloud consumption and cloud economics for most, and particularly while uh, MSP is coming into the fold and they're starting to look like the prime contractor and therefore everything comes through them, um, but they're only talking to procurement. So there's nothing about provisioning. So my question to you is, with all these shifts in the channel, what tools need to change? Surely from what I'm hearing from you guys, the existing tools aren't, aren't useful. And when, I'm, when I start to hear the complex technologies are being sold on the Amazon marketplace, I laugh because, you know, <laughs> unless you know what you're, what you're buying, it's, it's pretty useless to you. So those marketplaces can be useful for procurement of commodity-based stuff or manage recurring revenues after you've landed. But what happens before then? So, okay, I asked the .com can look after everything after it's landed. But what happens to land the sale? What tools so, are there to help land the sale? So, Nick, after doing the Canalis event last week, I think the, the outcome, because everyone was talking about, are those massive marketplaces, the hyper markets, um, are they a threat to the channel? Well, no, they're not a threat to the channel. They're just a different channel. At the end of the day, you still need a trusted advisor to guide an end user through, whether it's a, a tech, high tech products sitting on an Amazon store or you're physically delivering it, you still need someone to actually design a network, make sure it's going to function, more importantly to Julian's earlier point, lock it down as much as you possibly can. So mm. it's just a different part of the channel, not necessarily a channel killer, if you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Julian, I want your take on that because um, while you have this love fest between, between the two of you at the moment, I, I still need to uh, get everyone to understand that, okay, you certainly have lots of new marketplaces they're coming uh, and and they're here to stay and you, and all the vendors are sitting there and say, uh, are saying yeah but you've also got my you know portal to work with so lots of different portals and things like that it's as confusing as ever and you need something to democratize uh all that yes i ask it democratizes the channel and it's the uh, the transactions and it's the only one but prior to prior to having to manage the transaction what tools are you seeing, Julian, in the channel, uh, by, uh, released by vendors or distributors that are helping the channel mm -hmm. manage and, mo and, and, and work all this out, this thing called ecosystems? You know, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a two interesting examples. One is that uh, we were actually creating, uh, you know, the, a, a cybersecurity channel defense uh, ecosystem just for this purpose because there's 4,000 plus cybersecurity vendors and uh, we in the in the human world probably need maybe 10, 12, right? And uh, so if you look at the bigger picture, you got to take 4,000 choices into about 50 thereabouts. And then this becomes best of breed. And then you have to figure out what mix makes, you know, the best, you know, solution for you. Because as a cybersecurity, you know, company, uh, you might have a different uh, requirement if you're a bank compared to if you're a shoemaker, Right. Um, so that mix is critical, and but that mix need to be built from the solutions that makes the most sense. So if you went on to um, a website that's got 4,000 companies and there's four MDRs and whatever those terminologies are, or the 50 M, how do you pick one, yeah. right? Um, if you ever walk down the, the RSA aisle in an expo, you see lots of acronyms, right? And if you actually listen carefully, pretty much everyone sounds the same. Um, and if you went on everybody's websites, they pretty much sound the same. Um, and, and so therefore it's more of um, a play on confusion, right? Less is more. We now realize in cybersecurity that having 80 layers of cybersecurity protection of different solutions is not correct. Because what happens when Frank leaves and Frank's monitoring eight yeah. of these yeah. stacks, those yeah. stacks are no longer monitored or patched or whatever. So more is not necessarily better, simple, yeah. better integrated, more automated is better. Um, and so that's sort of where we're gravitating to 
as we just have this proliferation of solutions in the market. I, I was down at um, at the uh, Acronis uh, um, event in Miami, and um, I had their executive team there, and they were saying, uh, you know, how do we deal with all these uh, this problem? With we can't even find people, right? No. Um, and in a, in a score of millions, right? And the answer was sort of obvious: automate, 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 right? And so, um, you know, there is no choice. We have to move towards automation, but I'd like to add a prefix, smart automation, you yeah. know, with humans at the centerpiece so that we don't forget that, you know, we, we can't just build stuff to automate things. It doesn't make sense. So from my point of view, I've always run businesses from you lead people and manage systems. But if I can get a system to do the job, then my people get on with more creative functions. Therefore, they're happier. Your culture gets better. So it's actually taking out all of that, um, the rubbish that you have to deal with. And to Nick's point about portals earlier, I've got resellers that have to log into 30 different vendor portals. It's just not sustainable. They can't get a sales job done if they've got to log into portals to do deal reg and look up this bit and get some marketing material and all the rest of it. It just doesn't make sense. They should actually be using their own internal systems and let their internal systems go off to those 30 different manufacturers and pull that data through APIs. Then they're a lot more efficient and they can get on and have a better day. So Amen. I've got a little bit of a summary here from what you guys are saying so we can move on. Um, this new world of ecosystems uh, in terms of how it affects buyer behaviour uh, and, and meets buyer behaviour at, 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 at the end customer, uh, you have to leverage influencer communities because otherwise people won't see the technology. Uh, won't hear the technology, won't understand it. You have to leverage the automation tools because otherwise it's too costly to transact and manage. And also it won't meet the annual recurring revenue requirement. Um, and also uh, revenue growth will come from that installed base, but less is more because you can't confuse the, the, the transaction as, as, as we move forward into that almighty new method of influencing a sale. Is that a fair summary? Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, I'd also I'd also caution um, the community, and, and there's a lot of folks out there that talks a lot about the channel and the ecosystem, and you know all the data around that. So if you want to dig into those weeds, uh, there's some really good uh, content that you can get out there. Um, but I would also say that uh, just waking up one day and saying that you're now you have an, an ecosystem, right? Um, it's not, no, you know, it's that's not, the, that's just rebranding. That's the marketing talking, right? Yeah. Um, the pro, you know, I was, um, you know, equivalent to, um, I'm a good driver, but if you were to put me in a Formula One car, um, to race amounts <laughs> real Formula One drivers, even though I have the, if, give me the best car, give them all the worst cars, yeah. I will lose. Right. So. If I am, if I don't understand everything about that that uh, that ecosystem, right, and what it means, and why it means what it means, and how it all comes together, um, even though I'm a really good channel person, right, I may not be able to take this out on the road. And I think that's why a lot of companies are looking outside of the channel um, world, if you will, to bring that consultive um, aspect to it. Because it's about how do you put a business strategy together where the sum of the parts, you know, the synergy of all that stuff, you know, explodes, right? Uh, there's tons of examples of this from, you know, people like Intel and stuff and, and how they are playing in their ecosystems and so on. But, um, you know, I'm a student of it and I, I digest all this information um, from everyone. And you could sort of tell now the ones that's just, you know, putting the lipstick on it. Um, and the ones who are actually, you know, re redoing it, you know, rewiring it, so to speak. So there is a difference. And um, and I think that's sort of where the trend is moving. Um, but caution that it's still early days and no one has the real, you know, formula yet. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I can only agree with you, but I'll, I'll, I'll take that one step further in that um, as we as we move, um, we're seeing explosions of opportunities and that's 100% due to the fact that everyone's becoming a digital company. Everyone's, you know, got a digital tra transformation strategy, an abundance of opportunity, a massive amount of transactions. So uh, the thing that always worries me is uh, 
when people talk about ecosystems, they think that the traditional channel is dead and the traditional channel effectively had a mandate to manage transactions. That hasn't gone. In fact, that's probably more important than ever, that mandate, because there are more transactions now than ever, um, particularly in terms of the frequency of the same thing. You buy something, you don't have to worry about it for three years, five years, but you may get maintenance every year. No, now it's, it could be every day, every week, every month that you're that you, you know, reviewing and, and renewing. So transaction management won't go away as far as I'm concerned. Tell me why I'm wrong. Um, so just to just to jump in there, Nick, that's you know to pull apart two of the things. The first one is a transactional piece. You're absolutely correct in the the, the reseller tier, the VARs, MSPs, they are now challenged because they are getting tens of thousands of lines of transactions. You know, twenty dollars for a process of consumption, fifty dollars for a hard drive, and they're hitting this monthly. And again, to the to the high the the food chain tire up in the vendors. They don't understand that. They're just making themselves more efficient. If you don't make your channel more efficient, you won't derive any of those efficiencies because, you know, we've got one customer, we put in the subscription uh, billing engine and they were spending 10 man days a month putting invoices into ERP system, like who consumed that process, all that sort of thing. So there's the consumption piece, but to talk the bigger ecosystem piece outside of the and I, I think we should call it legacy IT channel, not necessarily traditional. But you've now got, we're uh, working with insurance companies. So the insurance company is selling extended warranty to the OEMs. They're an outside party to this ecosystem, but they need to track the asset, who bought it, where it lives, when it's coming back, has it gone out of warranty. So there's all these edge cases now surrounding what I would call a legacy IT channel that mm -hmm. is part of this bigger ecosystem. You're definitely you're definitely right, and uh, one of the things uh, with the channel, I just uh, uh, want to get us out there. A lot of people have been talking about the channel being dead for so many years, yeah. and <laughs> I usually, years. yeah, I when I when I hear some people execs talk about that, I I just sort of like turn and just go to my phone and start <laughs> texting somebody, um, and and you know playing some game or something because um, I don't I have no patience for stupidity. No, and right. um and honestly i think it's uh it the debate's been over like decades ago and and uh and i think people now realize that how do you go to market without a channel it just absolutely makes no sense um mm -hmm. whatsoever um the question is it's not the channel is how do you change your channel right to um make the most of what you have right um and it's an educational process uh, channel partners started from, you know, where you were with resale VARs and so on to MSPs and MSSPs and whatever they're going to be called themselves <laughs> next month. Um, the reality is that what's really changing is the way they do business. Mm. Is the business model is changing. It's not them. Their brains are changing in how they operate. But, I mean, come on. I mean, who wants to go to bed every night thinking that oh my god tomorrow i gotta sell you know ten thousand computers to meet my payroll yeah. as opposed to like oh i got my payroll covered last week because i got my mrr right i yeah. mean geez it doesn't take rocket science to figure out like i want to go with uh, plan b you know what i mean so this is kind of obvious sense so the challenge is how do you cross that chasm for these uh companies that is old way thinking if you will they're gonna they're gonna cross but only when they want to um, and what we're finding is um, there's a problem. And uh, the problem is that a big chunk of the uh, channel community are getting up there in age. You know, they're, uh, they're, they're retiring. They, they want out. They don't want to invest in becoming an MSSP, let alone an MSP. Um, they're looking for an exit strategy and so on. So, you know, we're now approaching um, 2025 where well over half that community is definitely going to be out. So there's going to be a massive gravitation towards whoever's left. Yeah. And there's a new breed of uh, MSPs, the one that's still got some years in them, that is acquiring these companies um, quite uh, aggressively uh, to carry on the business. So this transformation of knowledge, skills, and business model will happen regardless yeah. of what happens in the world, right? Because yeah. 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 whether the older folks retire or the the other people take it over, it's going to be happening. And the challenge is, is how do we uh, leverage that and accelerate that? Because what we want is more of that and less of the old stuff.
right? Um, but I never disregard, uh, discard any of these companies because I've seen enough transactions in companies' acquisitions to know that there's uh, there's always a really great way for people to forge relationships. Cool stuff. So then, on that, how do we how do we leverage what we have to be able to accelerate that new go to market that you, that you that you speak of? And it's absolutely a new go to market. It's more inclusive. Um, it's a reset. Uh, it's more transaction oriented, but it's also even more uh, consultatively oriented. There has to be some new platforms that the that the channel um, sure. can use um, at, to, to to take advantage of this ecosystem. Uh, elements to be able to be successful and, and accelerate that, that that go to market because it's how the consumers want to consume technology. What, what do you For say? Sure. What, what are some of these platforms that you guys are seeing? So there's probably, you know, over 150 or so um, platforms that's helping um, vendors, you know, manage their partners. Um, most of it uh, is, doesn't make sense. Um, and not because it's not a cool platform and it does certain things, it's just it just doesn't does enough. It does not do enough. Yeah. And uh, as Scott point, pointed out, mm -hmm. um, we know you know channel partners just has to visit like 30, 40, 50 portals, right? You got to hire people to do that, right? Do a deal reg for one vendor with eighteen pieces of information. The next one wants thirty. The next one wants five. Whatever. And if you ask every single channel chief on the planet, we're making our channel program more simple uh, because our partners want it to be more simple. Well, you know what? For the last decades, I think they've all been saying they make it simpler. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> where, where's the newness in there, right? And yeah. why did you make yeah. it more complex when they were always telling you to make it simple? Yeah. And the answer comes right back to the technology platforms that they're pushing into their systems. Not because everybody is using a platform. It is the cool platform to go with, right? You have to really look at the platforms to figure out what is it really doing at the partner level. And I also want to tell people to watch out for the, um, you know, the, the speed bump. And that is a lot of channel uh, executives will say, but we, we, we canvassed, we surveyed our partners. Yeah. And they said we're in the right direction. And I says, can I please look at the, uh, the survey? And who answered? And sure enough, is there a top 20, 10%, yeah. right? Yeah. Of partners. Yeah. Well, look, if I was answering, what would I say? Keep the way it is. We like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep where, the way it is. <laughs> so forget what the other guys say. Forget it. Keep the way it is. Right? So you are preaching to the converted, you know, and the reality is uh, it's just silly, silly games. Yeah. Um, and these companies, uh, the average channel person, I think, is in a job for about three to five years. And by the time you're talking with them, they're looking for the next gig and so on. So got to be careful here because the channel people, uh, the actual channel players are the ones who are left to pick up the pieces. Yeah. Right. So we need to do that. So if there was an air ecosystems that's going to solve this problem, uh, they need to be looking first at the partners and working your way back up. Yeah. All right. Because who cares what the product is? I don't. I think most partners will tell you, I don't care what brand I put in there, right? Um, but what they care about is the friction. Yeah. How much energy and effort it's taking me to you know, do these things and uh, what do I get in return and so on. Look, you know, I think um, a lot of companies, a lot of people have told me, and uh, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'll take the word at it. You know, Julian, you know, we're supposed to get a $900,000 check from vendor A because of all the rebates and all the cool incentives that we're supposed to do. And one day I'm sitting in my office, knocking on the door and then, uh, you know, Johnny or Frankie from the company shows up and says, Hey, I, I'm going to, I want to sell up our score. All right. And then they'll go through very rough numbers and say, well, you know, we, you, you think it's about 900,000, but we're seeing it's around 750. Yeah. Like I got a check right here right now for 750. Are you ready to go? Right, <laughs> so they sent a negotiator down, right? Yep. Um, to negotiate someone is supposed to get yeah. now. Had that process has been automated completely with no room for human interjection, right? I would have my $950,000 that I'm owed without having to listen to Frankie or Johnny uh, yeah, telling yeah. me about why you know it, it should be 750.
Yeah. And why would a vendor want to hire someone to do that anyways? Right. So you, you start to think in terms of like makes, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense. So automate the things where humans don't need to be. Mm. Right. So if I'm supposed to get $10, I want my $10. Yeah. You know, I don't want to beg for it. Yeah. Right. If I'm supposed to get this uh, budget for MDF, I want to get it. That's it. Um, and I want to be able to automate those things that's causing me so much friction that they give up. You know, if you ask a, a, a simple question to channel partners, you know, why don't you go after more MDF funds from, you know, the companies you work with? Man, you know what they make us do to get that stuff? Yeah. And then you ask the top uh, partners, we make a ton of money. We get millions from the vendors from MDF because it's just sign over and away you go. So th this is the, 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 the disparities in, in the whole game, right? And this is what I think the ecosystem is going to start to make more transparent, right? So that everybody can feel, wait a minute. So if I only have eight people, which is, you know, the, the average MSP is under 10, right? Um, and I want to do something and I would like to do to get some support from my partner, from my vendors. Um, I want to just do it without all this friction, right? And, and maybe... It will not work, but if a uh, hundred of them have a better frictionless experience, maybe eighty will work. So yeah. the net 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 gain will be you know incredible. So I think that that is the the ecosystem automation is about making the way removing the friction between everyone, but also allowing the channel partner itself to be able to find everything they need to do business. And that was the principle we baked out for the, the cyber defense you know, ecosystem. Underneath that is a platform, but also market research, market automation. And by the way, not all on the same platform, integrated platforms oh, by third party yeah. companies. Yeah. That's how you want to win the help them, you know, win the day, which you know, I think wins for everybody. So it's slightly, slightly differently, Julian. If you can deliver the information that the partner needs on a silver platter so they don't have to log anything, log into anything, they don't have to do anything, here's the deal, here's the information you need to go close it, whether it's a expand, extend, renew, whatever. All you have to do is put margin on it and walk out the door. That's a lot better than, well, log in, you're going to have to claim this, you're going to have to do this. You're going to, and my favorite, my favorite thing about deal reach in the IT industry is. The partners are going to register the deal and then go and sell a competitor's product because they've locked out one of the competitors. <laughs> yeah. You know, By the Scott, way, Scott, just to be that, what you're describing is the holy grail. Come on. No, right? That's, that's exactly so, what we do, Julie. But it exists. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the ultimate. I, I tell you what, guys, the, the uh, and, and you mentioned, uh, uh, Julian, that ecosystem automation is what people are looking for. They get the ecosystem once they understand that there is a transaction element as well as a consultation element uh, because automate whatever you can and, and design as much as you can, but make sure that it's uh, repetitive and recurring so you don't have to keep doing it again. Now, well and good, there are some, uh, some, some platforms that hit that holy grail, not many yet, and again, it's because they only do bits, and you mentioned, Julian, good but not good enough. Um, you know, Stas takes... Several, several, several years to, to build, not, you know, fly by night, but there is a lot of fly by night for some reason, wondering why there's confusion. I'm going to use that to close off and ask you guys, um, yeah, give a little bit of, bit, a bit of humor around this. Um, we started off with this idea, and I still keep getting smashed with it, but this, this ecosystem thing is a dying fad. What do you say to these? naysayers, and I get this 99% of the time from vendors, what do you say to them from the point of view of risk? And Scott, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Well, first of all, Nick, let me just pull apart on something you just said. Most of the things that you um, are attributing not very good platforms are actually tools. A tool does a single job. That's okay. where the issue is because they're not integrated into the larger internal or external ecosystem. A proper right. platform needs to connect to everything. That's the only way you're going to get the data set. So that's, you know, I see lots of tools out there, but there's not many platforms. Um, from a risk point of view, if you look at some of the uh, manufacturers and even some of the distributors that have expended 
all sorts of money on various internal portals and all the tools, and one's based on SAP and another one's based on Oracle, et cetera. They have spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars, and the code looks like it came from the 80s. You know, the UI is, you know, very simple, and the big guys might be able to get through it because they employ people to do it. But that's actually not the answer. You're better off spending, and, you know, I'm not talking any particular big money, but let's say $3 million or $5 million and actually get something that does the job and even if it didn't, you've blown three or five million rather than potentially a hundred million over a number of years of, of development. That's it. Where I see, you know, the lower risk is going in, not necessarily with us, but any SaaS platform, because it's already built, it's being upgraded every week. It's not, you know, you're not waiting for your internal IT team to, you know, drop what they're doing and go and build another module for you or fix a bug or whatever it is. That's, I mean, that's always been my uh, premise anyway. Thanks, Scotty. And Julian, same question. We'll close off yeah, with you. you Distributors have had a lot of uh, headwinds over the years, and um, the smart ones uh, have figured out exactly what you've done, Scott, is, uh, you know, build a platform that works, right? I uh, was just down at, uh, in Orlando with, uh, with Ingram Micro's uh, one event, and uh, you could check all the, the, the interviews on, on each end of the news. But, um, you know, they just launched something called uh, Xvantage, right, which is um, their, their platform, right? Um, so, you know, they want to make, make it uh, frictionless for their customers and so on to do business, meaning their partners and so on. Um, and, and no doubt that the, these platforms are necessary, right? That's where everybody needs to be, right? Um, the one thing that is of biggest value, I believe, of these companies is they've amassed this amount of data over the years of, uh, of doing business. And if they could figure out a way to leverage that data and serve it up to the rightful owners, I want to also add that yeah, to the rightful yeah. owners, yeah. Um, so they can then make sense of that and use that to close deals, open up opportunities, find where the crossovers are, the, the next things. Well, you win. You know, it's just that simple. And, and so I think the, the, the reality is, is that how do these platforms end up baking in enough of this intelligence into it, leveraging data to help these companies make sense of it? Um, and I think uh, that's the companies that I think you want to watch for who's going to be successful in this ecosystem game. Because at the end of the day, if the ecosystem is not going to accelerate sales and growth and profitability for the community that's in there, then what is the point? That's right. Right. If it only serves the, you know, the vendor, right? And this is why vendor-centric ecosystems has a problem yep. because it just means it serves that one vendor. So independent, multi-vendor ecosystems is the future. And I'll end with this. Where will all this end game be? Where is the end game be? I wrote an article about this um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I believe, about niche marketplaces. A niche marketplace is when a company, AMSP, uh, a channel partner, is able to find a platform that they could slap their logo on it, have the solutions and products that they want to sell in it, and have their own marketplace to their own customer base. Yep. And all that stuff being fully integrated to the back end of the world so things are, you know, put into their bins and provisioned and all that stuff automatically. Because at the end of the day, I see um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of niche marketplaces run by companies that's in their local regions and a company having, you know, 500 customers or 100 customers or sell to dentists or to lawyers or to whatever vertical market they're selling into. And they have gone and fine-tuned their own marketplaces to sell all the marketing, all the services and products that they want to sell in bundles, in pay-as-you-go, monthly fees, fully transactional, automatically renewed, manage up and down for licenses, and everybody is just happy. So yeah. I think that's where we're headed. Right now, if everybody wants to sort of control um, the game, by having everybody play within their marketplace, it is cool, but it's cooler when we're actually able to allow uh, the channel partners 
to rule with their own marketplaces. And I, I think the, the world will be better. I think the vendors will be better. The distributors will be better. Everybody in this ecosystem will win if that power is wielded in the hands of these MSPs and channel partners. And I'll just say that because there is no one on planet Earth who knows their customers better than the channel partners. That's right. To close off, you touched on a great point, both of you actually, is uh, the idea of a, a vendor ecosystem. It's almost a nonsense because no technology lives in uh, isolation, right? If there's seven or eight or nine, uh, uh, it used to be one or two, but now it's seven, eight or nine, and we've got reference architectures galore. And that's the, the, the ecosystems that have to support that reference architecture, not the other way around. Um, so therefore, the tools will come out of that. And uh, I, I couldn't agree with more with that sentiment. Uh, gents, we're at the top of the hour. We've covered everything really well. I really appreciate the um, the, the information, uh, the education, uh, and, as, and as well as some of the trending and forward thinking that we need to care about. I know it's answered the questions that uh, our audience wanted answered. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for joining us on this, uh, this uh, episode of Channel Talks. And we'll see you again very, very soon. Cheers. Thanks, Nick. Cheers. Thank you.